Good morning. We're going to do the MDRO um, session this morning for the next few minutes. Uh, I have titled the MDRO session, The Challenging Road to Success, because I feel like from my conversations with users that while on the surface, the MDRO module seems relatively straightforward, um, it is very challenging to a lot of people. Um, so as we think about the challenges, I want to throw out the concept of someday to you. Now, I was raised in a multi-generational household, a lot of really strong women, and everybody had what we called a someday list. Now, my mother started me on my someday list uh, very early. She in instilled the importance of education and higher learning and continuing to learn so that you could someday be all you want to be. And that was great. Um, my one of my grandmothers, because I lived with several, um, as a teenager, signed me up for self-defense classes so that someday when you find yourself in a tight spot, you'll be able to take care of it yourself. And that actually came in handy uh, as a teenager when during a, what I'll call a spirited exchange of ideas with one of my brothers, <laughs> He inadvertently added to my someday list by suggesting that someday, maybe your IQ will be higher than your body weight. <laughs> my sister-in-law assures me that the little bump in his nose where the brake didn't quite heal correctly just adds character to his face. But... When I became an IP, my someday list grew by leaps and bounds. I took over an IP job that had been vacant for a while, and um, it was very challenging to me, and I would find myself studying hard. There were not nearly the training opportunities that we have available to us today, and I, I just kept thinking, someday, someday, I'm going to really know this NHSN stuff. Um, so I would suggest to you that someday can be any day. And for our purposes, why can't someday for understanding the MDRO and the CDF protocol be today? And I am here to help you with the success of understanding. Now, again, as I said, you know, on the surface, the MDRO protocol looks pretty straightforward. And it would be that you could get from point A to point B relatively in a straight line. But anybody who has worked with MDROs and C. difficile knows that there are all sorts of nuances to how we do this work. So success really can take a lot of twists and turns. But hopefully by the end of our session, you're going to be at the success point because we're going to work to help you grasp the surveillance and the lab ID event reporting parameters. Um, I'm going to point out the very numerous web resources that we have for uh, the reportings that we do. We're going to talk about definitions and reporting guidance, and I'm going to use a lot of screenshots to help you know how to correctly enter your data uh, numerator and denominators, which is important. So as you all know, the path to success can sometimes be a little steep. I have a couple of disclaimers that I want to share with you as well. So the biggest lie I always tell myself is, oh, I don't need to write that down. I'm going to remember it. <laughs> so I would encourage you to take lots of notes, jot down questions as they come to you, and we will have time to do that. And then secondly, as I get involved in teaching about MDRO and C. difficile, I sometimes do misspeak. And I know that you will keep me honest and you will point out when that happens. Uh, and hopefully I haven't put both of my feet in my mouth so that I can't answer and have a leg to stand on. Reminder, success only comes before work in the dictionary. So we have a little work to do here.
and I think we should get started with it. The first thing I'm going to share are some web resources. This is the web link to the protocol itself. This will take you directly to the MDRO and the C. difficile protocol. If you pull that up, here's what the picture of the website looks like. And as you see, the tabs are lined up very similarly to our other chapters within the patient safety manual. Um, Particularly, I always encourage users to print a hard copy of the protocol. This is highlighted in yellow here. Remember, we do review these on an annual basis and they are updated. So each year, each calendar year, you have a new protocol that you need to review and ensure that there have not been any changes. And we also always offer guidance when we're preparing to do that. I have arrows here for our frequently asked questions. I don't think that that is quite used as much as it could be, and I would encourage you to uh, check that out. As I mentioned before, if you're reading through the MDRO protocol itself, you're going to get all the basic information, but we simply cannot put every single piece of information that you need to do this reporting in that protocol document. So we use our FAQs to help clarify some of the special circumstances or some of the nuances to the reporting. I also have uh, the MDRO and CDI Lab ID event calculator pointed here, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that uh, shortly. We get a lot of questions about CMS requirements. You can get the CMS requirements on the page with uh, the protocol, but we have had such interest that there is actually a CMS page now. And as you can see here, um, uh -oh, let's go back. Um, the document, let's see if I can make this work. Right here, this one was updated in January 2019. And it has the reporting requirements for all of the different uh, quality reporting programs, depending on the setting of the facility. So if you need that, it is also on the website. Um, we do get questions about the reporting deadlines. I will remind you that the next reporting deadline is May the 15th, and that will be for quarter four, 2018. So everybody's still interested in superbugs. We are in a lot of discussions about MDROs. We have many, many different working groups, and this is a hot topic. So we feel like that this area of focus will continue to be important as we move forward um, in the NHSN reporting world. Let's talk about definitions. I know that a lot of facilities have internally some definitions that they use to define certain MDROs. For NHSN reporting purposes, we have a select number of organisms that we would consider multi-drug resistant organisms that can be submitted into NHSN. And if you want to use the NHSN database for submission, you have to use our definitions as well. Uh, these are in the protocol proper. Um, they are lined up a little differently. I moved MRSA and C. difficile to the top because those are the two organisms that are most frequently reported to us. I want to point out that for MRSA, we tweaked the language slightly just to make it a little bit more current and relatable. And it now reads, uh, cultured from any specimen that tests oxacillin resistant, sofoxetin resistant, or methicillin resistant by standard susceptibility testing methods or any laboratory finding of MRSA. Uh, and we hope that that helps some people. I will just point out for those people who are doing CRE reporting that um, we do have a very specific definition for CRE, which may differ slightly from the local laboratory definition for CRE. I've gotten some questions sometimes about um, we think this is a CRE organism, but it, do, it doesn't have the same parameters as your definition, can we report it? And the answer to that would be no. If it doesn't meet our reporting definition, you should not be entering it into uh, NHSM. 
If you look at the module proper, it has many different reporting options. Up at the top here, you see that we have two primary reporting methods. Uh, you can do infection surveillance, which uh, can be any of the MDROs that we previously listed, or you can do lab ID event reporting. Also within this module, you can follow prevention process measures and you can perform uh, certain outcome measures if you so choose. Um, you just tell us which of those you wanna follow. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison of lab ID event reporting and infection surveillance reporting using the HII surveillance definitions from chapter 17. I just uh, throw this up because a lot of people don't even realize that this exists. And it is, I think I wrote the paper down. It's the appendix three that is found within chapter 12 on page 50. If you want to go back and look at that, it will tell you exactly where the differences are. And we're going to talk a little bit about both of these reporting options more briefly on infection surveillance and then more in depth on lab ID events. If you want to do infection surveillance for any of the MDRO organisms, you would select that reporting option on your monthly reporting plan. It is selected by the particular uh, location. Back wide in is not an available option for infection surveillance. You can see here that I've chosen a burn unit to illustrate CRE reporting, and you would pull the infection surveillance checked here. You can do lab ID event surveillance and infection surveillance on the same individual unit. And if you do it that way, you will have numbers specifically for that unit. Uh, and some facilities like to do that. And you can do any of the MDRO organisms by the individual unit, not only CRE. Back wide in is the option for lab ID event reporting. And it is the facility wide level. Although when you are submitting events, you are submitting them by location. The analysis is at the back wide end level. Um, you can see here that this demonstration is for C. difficile for the lab ID events. And then this facility wants to monitor C. difficile in ICU and CCU. Though they've marked infection surveillance. And I provided here the GI-CDI infection criteria, which you were apply to determine if an HAI infection event has occurred. All right, everybody take a deep breath. We're getting ready to rumble. <laughs> All right, let's talk about lab ID events specifically. So why do we want to monitor MDROs and C. difficile? Um, there are different reasons for different facilities. We think that it's very helpful in um, evaluating local trends and the occurrences of these pathogens. There's a nationwide interest in what types of multi-drug resistant organisms are occurring and where. We do know there's some geographic differences. Um, it offers each facility a way to report and analyze their data, which will help inform the infection prevention staff in their targeted prevention efforts. We realize that you just don't have an abundance of resources and you really have to drill down to figure out where your prevention efforts are going to be best served. And certainly this data can help do that. We know that we've seen an increase in the prevalence of most of the multi-drug resistant organisms, although I will put a plug in for our MAT team's um, HAI progress report that was released last week. I hope you've had a chance to look at it. If not, um, it's a wonderful document that shows trends over time, and if you go to the patient safety atlas, you can actually pull the data by state and see specifically what is the problem in your state area. Uh, and the progress report did indicate that we've made 
some progress. Uh, with MRSA, we've, we've seen some substantial decreases, and even in C. difficile, we are noticing some decreases. But the goal for, in particular for C. difficile is to reduce rates by 30% by 2025. Right now, we're at about 13%. So we have a ways to go with that, certainly. What I found out when I went to look at the cost, hospital costs for treatment and penalties uh, for these uh, MDROs, top 10 billion in 2016, I got that from a, a public consumer website called Fierce Healthcare. Uh, if you look at C. difficile, we know that it has some pretty broad implications and uh, unfortunately does have a significant mortality rate as well. Uh, the CDC reports that C. difficile infections add $4.8 billion in extra health care cost each year, which is huge. So there's a lot of reasons to follow these things. Some of the advantages that we think we can offer is objective lab-based metrics. Everybody knows, or hopefully you know, that lab ID event is based on a proxy measure of a positive lab report. Um, it does allow you to identify vulnerable patient populations and estimate infections and exposure burdens. Um, these are standardized definitions, which allows us to have confidence in the comparability between the different facilities that report into the NHSN. The basic fact wide in standard reporting guidance is to report the first positive specimen for the patient and the location as a lab ID event. After this initial submission, there should be greater than 14 days or 15 days if you want to look at it that way between positive specimens in this location before you submit a new lab ID event. And this is what we, we call the lab ID event 14 day rule. So there's a little bit of confusion sometimes about the, the lab ID rule, which is different from RIT. The lab ID event rule is location specific. If the patient transfers into a new inpatient location, this rule resets your time frame starts again. Uh, this guidance does uh, apply to all of our inpatient locations, including any uh, inpatient units that have the different CCN. That seems to be a sticky point for some people. It also includes emergency rooms and 24-hour observation locations. So that is our basic reporting guidance. Some of the things that kind of trip people up is the date admitted to the facility. This is an important piece of information to lab ID event reporting in particular because the date admitted to the facility will drive your event categorization. So for NHSN reporting purposes, the date admitted to the facility is the calendar day the patient locates to an inpatient location for the first time. We don't drill down to the time of day, but it is the calendar day. And any time that is spent in an outpatient location, such as the ED or on a dedicated 24-hour observation unit, would be time prior to admission. We do not use status for reporting. We understand that at the local level, there are a lot of billing requirements that um, put people into certain statuses. So uh, very, very simply to us, an inpatient is a patient who is housed or cared for on an inpatient location for the facility. An outpatient is a patient housed on an outpatient location, such as the ED or the 24-hour observation unit. And you can label your patients any way you want to. You can call them observation. You can say we, they're in a swing bed. They're a short-stay patient. But the location where they are housed drives whether or not they are an inpatient or an outpatient. We do base our reporting solely on the positive laboratory test. There is no clinical evaluation, which 
intentionally was selected to be less labor intensive um, to the IP and for the facility in the reporting. So symptoms are not used and it doesn't matter if your uh, patient admits with symptoms for lab ID event reporting, it is strictly the date of occurrence which is gonna drive how we categorize your events. Lab ID event reporting is by single facility. Everybody has their own designated NHSN org ID and you report under that ID. Um, prior positives at different facilities have no bearing on the reporting of events at your facility, nor will they influence the categorization. Events are always reported by the patient and the location, and you don't have a lab ID event until the patient is in a bed in your facility on an eligible inpatient location, and you collect a positive specimen. The transfer rule does not apply to lab ID event reporting. Lab ID events are always attributed to the location where the positive specimen is collected. There is no time frame associated for this. I get questions occasionally where the patient transferred, she had an order for um, a C. diff test, she was on the new unit for about four hours when they got the specimen. I really think I, I want to attribute this back to the, the prior location because she was there for 10 days and she was only in this location for four hours. It, it's attributed to the location where the positive specimen is collected and that is just black and white, no exclusions. So four, uh, FACWIDE in reporting of, of lab ID events. You can only use FACWIDE in, and that's how we analyze it. It does include all of your inpatient locations, and you should have all of your locations mapped for use with event reporting, uh, lab ID event reporting. Um, it includes all of your observation patients that may be housed in an inpatient location, plus your emergency departments and your 24-hour observation locations. And again, events are attributed to where the positive specimen is collected. We do have exclusions for baby-based locations for C. difficile lab ID event reporting, and you'll find that information in the protocol. There is only one exception for lab ID event reporting, and that is um, exception is when the patient starts in an affiliated outpatient location, not the ED or the 24-hour observation location, but perhaps you're in a large system who has clinics or uh, physician offices and they are under the same medical record system as the main hospital. And you can track your scope of services across the spectrum. For the person who has a positive specimen collected in an affiliated outpatient location that admits to the facility on the same calendar day as the specimen collection, we will allow you to submit a lab ID event for the positive specimen and it is attributed to the first inpatient location where the patient goes when they are admitted. And this is the only exception or exclusion that we have with lab ID event reporting. So what's location got to do with it? When um, CMS put together multiple reporting programs and began to um, ferret out the different settings. Inpatient rehab and inpatient cycle facilities were affected slightly because they often operate under a unique CCN or one that is different from the acute facility. But because they are inpatient units for the facility, we simply consider transfers between these units as a continuous stay. I do know that locally it is not unusual for billing purposes that the patient is discharged from rehab, for instance, and readmitted to the acute care facility if there's a crisis. But for NHSN purposes, if the patient is in the same building on an inpatient unit, you are just transferring from one location to another. Your facility admissions should reflect the date the patient 
was first admitted either into the acute care uh, location or into the rehab or psych location, whichever is first. And we will pull out these events on psych and the rehab from the events that are uh, submitted for your acute care facility. And those are all analyzed differently and we'll use the data admitted to the location for analysis purposes. Here is just a schematic of a facility who has some mapped locations. And what I wanted to do was to point out that yes, first the operating room is an inpatient location and you should have that mapped so that you can use it with identifying the date admitted to the facility. It is not eligible for attribution of the event, but if this is the first inpatient location that the patient goes to, it is eligible for identifying date of admission. You can see that the first uh, portion of the emergency department is out. The first portion of the rehab uh, is in, and that tells us that this is an outpatient location and this is an inpatient location. Um, we don't have any real strict rules on how often you need to review your mapping. I generally would suggest that when you're doing your annual survey, it might be a good time for you to look at how your locations are mapped. I understand from my days as an IP that sometimes uh, the intent of a location changes. The patient's population served on the units change. And you can update your locations if that does happen. But you want to make sure that you have your all your inpatient locations mapped for the facility within NHN, in HSN so that you can use them with lab ID event reporting. All right, so... Let's talk just a minute about your monthly reporting plan, which is super important to us because the monthly reporting plan informs us of what kind of data we should expect from the facility. Uh, anything that you mark on your reporting plan is called in-plan data. And like I said, it tells us what we should expect. It also tells us what type of analysis we can do, and that includes sharing data with CMS. So you must enter a plan for every month of the year. It should be um, inclusive of all of the reportings that you intend to follow uh, and want us to analyze for you. And we can only submit data to CMS for complete months. And as you know, CMS submission is a quarterly outcome measure, the SIR. If we don't have all three months of the quarter in place, we cannot do the appropriate analysis for you. I know a lot of you are doing uh, CDA downloads or some sort of an electric type of submission, but if you're looking at the monthly reporting plan manually, if you just pull it up in the application, you're always going to start with selecting FACWIDE in. Um, this is the little scheme as to how you find that. And you want to make sure that you have FACWIDE in rows for C. difficile and MRSA if those are the two organisms that you are most interested in monitoring. If you have emergency departments and or 24-hour observation locations mapped within your facility, they will automatically be added to your monthly reporting plan for you. Um, if you're in the middle of the month and you have a new emergency room open, you would have to manually go back and add that new emergency room because your monthly reporting plan would have already been filed and the application won't know to go back and do it. But at the beginning of the month, if you add a monthly reporting plan that includes FACWIDE in and you have emergency departments and 24-hour observation units, those rows will be added and they will mimic exactly your selections uh, from the FACWIDE in line. If you were reporting for your inpatient rehab, 
those reporting rows do not auto populate because not everybody has them. Uh, so you have to go in and you have to add those rows to the monthly reporting plan so that we know to expect that data for you. As um, most people probably know who work in rehab and long-term acute care, the LTAC, CMS informed us that beginning with quarter four 2018 data, they no longer wanted us to send them uh, SIRs for rehabs and LTACs. That does not mean that the reporting option has been removed. It is still there. Uh, I think there's some benefit to continuing to monitor MRSA bacteremia uh, in the rehab in the LTAC setting. It is really the facility's decision what they mark on the monthly reporting plan anyway. You know, I get questions from users about what do you require that we report to NHSN? And our standard answer for that is NHSN does not have required reporting. You tell us what you want to report on your monthly reporting plan, and we expect data based on that. I usually recommend that that there are influences on the selections for monitoring. Um, maybe you have organizational goals, and that will drive your monitoring. There may be state requirements. Uh, you may be interested in being in compliance with your CMS quality reporting program. Um, so there are certainly influences, but NHSN in and of itself does not tell you what selections to make on your monthly reporting plan. So in the rehab and also in the LTAC, you can still select to do MRSA bacteremia live ID events, but we will not be providing CMS that information starting with quarter four uh, 2018 data, which again is due by May 15th. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about MRSA bacteremia and C. difficile a little bit more. So I'm going to start with C. diff. And as you can see here, and what you probably already know, is that C. diff has undergone a name change, and it is now known as Clusteroides difficile. But throughout the protocol and all of our training materials, and as we teach, we still use the synonyms C. difficile, C. diff, CDI, or CD. And all of those are absolutely uh, appropriate and the same. The organism uh, underwent a name change based on some taxonomy updates that were placed uh, through SNOMED, and we just adjusted in that. The definition for a C. difficile lab ID event has not changed. It is still based on a positive laboratory test for toxin A and or B. It includes molecular assays like PCR and toxin assays tested on unformed stool or a toxin producing C. difficile organism by culture or other laboratory means performed on unformed stool. Last year, to assist the facilities who had uh, initiated what we termed multi-step testing algorithms for identification of C. diff, we added a little reporting note that indicated that the last test performed in the multi-step algorithm will drive whether or not you can meet this CD positive laboratory assay definition. Uh, after that, I, I got some questions about what exactly is a multi-step testing algorithm and is that basically any test that's done on the same patient during their stay at the hospital. Um, and the answer to that is no. We have added a little language in the note to help you clarify that. So a multi-step testing algorithm is when more than one test or C. difficile is performed on the same unformed stool specimen. Um, you would use the finding of the last test performed to determine if the C. difficile positive laboratory assay definition is met. And we hope that that will help clarify things substantially for our users. So pull out your poll everywhere uh, mechanisms. You'll need your cell phone or a web top. The web streamers are invited to join, and we're just going to kind of review slightly. 
what I just covered. So uh, this facility monitors C. difficile lab ID events using a primary testing method of GDH antigen and EIA toxin. In this laboratory, they use a lot of interpretive notes on the final lab report to help with the clinical decision making uh, about treatment. And this note included a finding may represent latent infection, further testing recommendation. The laboratory results are GDH antigen positive, EIA toxin positive. And the question is, should this finding be submitted as a lab ID event? And you may poll for just a few minutes if you so choose. All right, we're going to see what the answer is. Yes, the answer is yes. The final test performed is EIA toxin. It's resulted as positive. So this is a lab ID event. And you should note that any interpretive statements added to the final lab report by your laboratory are considered clinical information and would not influence the findings for the lab ID event reporting purposes. All right, so here is another scenario that I will ask for you to consider. This facility is monitoring C. difficile with the primary testing method of GDH plus EIA with PCR for discrepant results. And the final laboratory findings were GDH antigen positive, EIA toxin negative, and PCR positive. Should this finding be submitted as a lab ID event? Hmm. So the majority of people think yes, and that is correct. The final test performed is the PCR, and it has a positive finding noted. So this is a lab ID event and would be submitted as such. We're going to have some more case studies a little later on. You'll get some more practice with that. Uh, so wrap your mind around it as best you can right now. And we'll, we'll visit it again a little later. So what happens when you test formed stools? Because the CDI-positive laboratory assay definition includes specifically that testing must be on unformed stool, um, we don't want you to be testing form stool. Um, we do recommend that you give your laboratory some support and some authority to reject inappropriate specimens. Make it easy on yourself. If your laboratory doesn't test form stool, you don't have a hard time trying to decide whether or not the findings qualify for lab ID event reporting. Um, it does offer a quality check in a lot of different manners. You know, maybe it could be a check on uh, collection practices up on the floor. Um, it does involve some clinical judgment, however, so just be sure that the lab does use some one of the standard criteria for determining what qualifies as unformed stool. We don't necessarily recommend any uh, specific algorithm. There's uh, just a few out there, and the most prominent one that we've heard of is the Bristol stool chart. So here's the algorithm for following C. difficile, and as you can see, it just reiterates the message we've already delivered. So let's do a case study. So this is my friend Kim, and as a surprise for her 50th birthday, we have a beach getaway weekend that includes a bar crawl through several local seafood spots. It was a good time. <laughs> Uh, when Kim gets home, she starts having some abdominal problems, cramps with stool. She then progresses to nausea, vomiting, and she ends up in the local ER um, where she's very dehydrated, has some tachycardia, diarrhea, and they think probably she has some food poisoning. 
But um, the very efficient ER physician says, collect one of those stool specimens and submit it for enteric pathogen panel testing so we can make sure what we're dealing with. And when that is done, the testing includes C. difficile and the C. diff result is noted to be PCR positive, which is their standard method of testing. So this facility participates in FACWIDE in C. difficile lab ID event reporting. Does that C. diff finding represent a lab ID event? Well, y'all are quick on the draw. <laughs> Okay. Yes. And why is it yes? We have a loose stool. We have a CD result that is noted to be positive. And that meets the CDI positive laboratory assay definition. So the little nuance here is this was an enteric panels testing. So more than C. difficile was tested, but you would zone in on the C. difficile piece of it if you are following C. difficile lab ID events, and it is an eligible testing for C. difficile. Again, I know a lot of you are doing electronic downloads, but if you pull up the event form in its manual state, you can tell very easily what pieces of information are required to be reported. They will have the red asterisks. I've highlighted them here in yellow. I will point out that on the outpatient event, you need to make sure that you say yes for outpatient so that your outpatient locations populate down for your location box. Um, for those of you who have been doing Lab ID event reporting for a while, you will notice that the question date admitted to facility no longer lives on the outpatient event reporting form. Uh, there was a lot of confusion about that, so we have removed that question from the form. Um, the only extra question that you have to answer is, has the patient been discharged from your facility in the past four weeks? If you look at the inpatient form, again, you're gonna have to say outpatient equal no, so that your inpatient locations populate your location box. The date admitted to the facility is included on your event reporting form for inpatients because that piece of information is required with categorization, which we're going to talk about uh, shortly. And again, the only extra question is, has the patient been discharged from your facility in the last four weeks? Um, the last question documented evidence of previous infection autopopulates, and that is a look back for prior events at your specific facility. It's not just like if the patient has ever had any before that you know about. It's only events at your facility and it is for prior months. So if you're reporting multiple events in the same month and the first event you report is answered no, all of the events in that month are going to be answered no because they are not eligible for use with this question until the month is completed. So once you've entered the event for CDI, the application will automatically categorize it in one of these ways. It is going to be categorized as a healthcare facility onset if the specimen collection occurs greater than three days after admission, so on or after hospital day four. Community onset, it's going to be any outpatient event or any event that occurs in an outpatient location, such as the ED or the 24-hour observation, or less than three days of admission, so hospital day one, which is your day of admission, hospital day two or three, and then a subset of uh, the community onset would be the COHICFA categorization where you have a community onset event collected from a patient who was discharged from the facility less than or equal to four weeks, specifically 28 days. The current event date 
is hospital day one. It is a backward count of 28 days. Um, then we will further categorize your CDI as either an incident event or a recurrent event. I'll let you read through those. And I'll just mention that recurrent events categorization, again, is dependent on events that occur at the specific facility. You cannot apply recurrent to an event in a patient at your facility that you know had C. difficile last month at another facility. Uh, the application is automatically applying these categorizations and they are facility specific. You can check for the categorization by running a line listing. I'm not going to steal the thunder from my Mac colleagues, uh, but I did just want to point out that if you run the line listing, you can see what the categorization has been applied. And remember that COHITFA is simply a subset of the CO, and neither of those are contributing to SIR. So let's review C. difficile real quick. C. difficile toxin uh, positive specimens are monitored on inpatient locations, which do include ED and 24-hour observations, but not baby-based locations. Uh, you have to give us all of your lab ID events. There was a little misunderstanding from some facilities that uh, they didn't think they had to report community onset events. Yes, any eligible specimen that meets the definition should be submitted into NHSN and then we'll categorize them for you. Uh, only loose stools should be tested for C. difficile and a CD positive test finding on a loose stool specimen will be a lab ID event where there is no previous positives for 14 days for the patient and the location. All right, so now we're going to move into MRSA bacteremia. So this seems to be a little easier for a lot of people because we're working with MRSA positive blood cultures. And blood cultures are normally only collected when there is a physician order and they are going to be used for some sort of clinical decision-making purpose. Um, we're looking for MRSA positive blood specimens for the patient and the location where there is no prior po MRSA positive blood specimens within 14 days, again, for the patient and the location. And this does include across calendar months if you are following blood specimen only reporting. If you're doing all specimens, it's a little different, and I'd be happy to talk with you separately about that. Uh, so again, the lab ID event is your first MRSA positive blood culture for the patient and the location. A unique blood source is important uh, when we are analyzing these events. And a unique blood source is going to be your first MRSA positive uh, blood culture for the patient or one that is greater than 14 days or 15 days from a prior positive. Um, blood isolates collected within 14 days for the same patient in the same location are simply duplicates and would not be reportable. And again, the first MDRO for the patient month and location is reported if you are following all specimens reporting. And we're not going to get into that very deeply, but I'll be happy to talk to anyone who wants more information on that. So I put together this little ditty to help boost up the MDR and CDI lab ID event calculator. If you do a lot of MRSA blood cultures at your facility, the calculator can be a really great tool to help you decide which events have to go into NHSN. So I wrote this, there once was an NHSN MDRO tool, the lab ID calculator, how cool. When used, event determinations become old school and makes the IP drool. Yeah, my kids tell me don't give up your day job. But again, this can be a very 
good assistive device for you, particularly if you're doing a lot of blood culturing at the facility. Um, this is how you can find it uh, on the web page, and you can put in the different organisms. You can see that all of our MDROs are eligible to use with this. You can check blood specimens or all specimens. You can use Juterix locations, but be sure that you get the right year uh, because, again, the protocols change, so the calculator uses the information for the specific year. Here's the algorithm for determining MRSA uh, bacteremic lab ID events. This actually came from our lectora. I'll put a little plug in for our lectoras. Our training um, page is just full of all sorts of opportunities for you if you want to check those out. I'm going to scoot through these really quickly because they're pretty much the same as what we saw with C. difficile. Um, inpatient and outpatient events have a slight difference. Again, we removed the date admitted to facility from the outpatient event, but otherwise this is the same information that we covered previously. So when we have MRSA Lab ID events submitted, uh, NHSN will again automatically categorize them for you in one of two ways, either community onset or healthcare onset. These are the same definitions that we saw with C. difficile, but you will notice that COHICFA is not an eligible categorization for MRSA bacteremic Lab ID events. And during analysis, we will identify the unique blood sources, and those will drive some of our analysis as well. And you'll hear more of that later. You can pull up a line listing to see the categorizations for your MRSA Lab ID events. It's a little different than the C. difficile. We do have the onset column, but here in the very last column, the, uh, th this is the fact why in MRSA, if there is a zero in the column, that is a non-unique specimen. If there is a one in this column, that indicates that this is a unique blood source. So let's do another knowledge check. So get your polling things ready. You know what they call them? Cell phones. It's like you're in jail. We're, we're you know. <laughs> um, so this is our friend Janet, who went to Jungle World uh, during the beach getaway weekend, um, and she enters a local gator wrestling tournament. There may have been a little adult beverage that drove that decision. Um, during the victory round, the gator got frisky and chomped down on her leg, and she had a deep gash, which they were able to kind of take care of, and she did win the Victor's Cup. But after returning home, she becomes a little lethargic. She notes some red streaks around that gash. So she goes to her doctor, who um, is concerned and directly admits her to uh, an acute care facility, MC3 East location, where blood cultures are collected that later return MRSA positive. Antibiotics are initiated, and she gets better. And on hospital day four, she's moved to a step-down unit, getting ready for discharge. Um, and when the MD writes his discharge orders, he includes blood culture draw to document clearance. And these blood cultures later return MRSA. So our first question is, is the three East event community onset or hospital onset? Y'all are very quick on the draw. I'll give you just a minute. Okay. So, they are community onset because the blood cultures are drawn on hospital day one. All right, so what about the step-down unit? Are those community onset or are those hospital onset? A little variation in opinions here. 
we're all friends, no problems. <laughs> all right, let's see. So this is a healthcare onset event because it occurs on hospital day four. As you can see, she's in a different unit. So it is a new MRSA positive blood culture. It is the first MRSA positive blood culture for the patient in this location. And it is reportable and will be categorized as healthcare onset based on the date of occurrence. At the community onset, healthcare onset level of, of assignment, we are looking at a, this being a location level assignment and there is no comparing to prior events. So we very often see scenarios where patients come in and they have positive blood cultures on the day of admission, they're admitted, they're treated, and then seven days later, new blood cultures are drawn and they're still positive. Any blood culture collected on or after hospital day four will always be assigned a healthcare onset categorization. All right, so let's review. We're monitoring MRSA positive blood cultures throughout all inpatient locations. It does include the ED and the 24-hour observation location, even though they're outpatient locations. Those are included in the fact white in umbrella. You want to enter all eligible MRSA positive events, community onset and healthcare onset. And a blood specimen qualifies as an event if there has not been a previous positive MRSA lab report for that patient in this location within 14 days. All right, take a deep breath. We're getting ready to talk about denominator data. Okay, so this seems to be a little bit of a challenge. This is one of those hurdles to success for some people, but you do have to provide denominator data for uh, the locations that you are reporting. And most people are reporting fact wide in. So when you get ready to talk about fact wide in, you're going to look and you're going to find this field will come up. We have modified it slightly from previous years. You will notice that we have assigned lines. They're no longer rows. Um, but line two was formerly called MDRO row two, and line three was formerly seen as CDI row three. We felt like you could benefit from having the actual equation there in front of you when you were putting your counts in. So we're basically asking for the same information we have always asked you to provide. It just looks a little different and people are getting thrown off by that slightly. But line one continues to be counts from all inpatient locations in the facility. Line two is your inpatient counts minus your CMS or your unique CCN certified units. And line three is inpatient locations minus your CCN certified uh, units and your baby-based locations. So if we see a denominator field that looks like this, we immediately recognize that there's problems. Line two and line three are asking for the patients that are at risk for the condition. We are not asking you to provide a count of people who have been diagnosed with an MDRO or CDI or suspected. Um, it's anyone housed in the locations that might be at risk for it. So the way the business rules are set up, line one is usually your highest counts. Line two can be 
low, can be the same but cannot be higher than line one. And line three can be the same but cannot be higher than line two. Each denominator row is basically a subset of the row above it. And when we see really low counts on line two and line three, we feel this is probably an incorrect data entry. And we uh, do some outreach on that. For LTACs and um, rehabs, freestanding rehabs, the denominator form simply asks for two boxes of information, your inpatient uh, facility days and your total facility admissions. If you're doing, if you have an inpatient rehab unit within the acute care hospital, you will still need to continue to provide specific rehab unit counts, patient days, and total admissions so that we have that available. If you have EDs and observation units, uh, remember, you are not collecting patient day data from these locations. You are instead collecting total encounters. For NHSM purposes, one encounter equals one visit. Uh, and we leave it up to you as to how you collect that particular type of data. But you need to provide it for every reporting month where you have these locations included on your monthly reporting plan. We still need your CDI test type on a quarterly basis. I apologize that I could not uh, bring an updated screenshot for this. As you know, we haven't completed the first quarter of the year, so our, our new denominator data screen for March won't be available until April the 1st. Uh, but I did wanna point out that we We'll continue to ask for the primary testing method at the end of every quarter. So four times a year, you'll be providing your primary testing method for C. difficile. If you happen to make it through a month and you have no events, you would need to check off the report no events box, which is a quality check. We used to just assume if we didn't find any events, you didn't have any. But um, now we ask you to tell us that you had no events. And if we don't find any events and this box is not checked off, your reporting is not considered complete. Um, sometimes pay, uh, I get questions about, I didn't have any event when I got to the end of the month, so I reported, I checked off my report no event box, and then the next week I found a report that I had missed and I had to put in an event. Is that a problem? It is not. The application will simply uncheck the box for you if an event goes in late. So, have we achieved success? I hope so. Uh, I hope that you have a better understanding of why we are doing surveillance, specifically for MRSA bacteremia and C. difficile. I um, am confident that you've got it down pat now about the parameters uh, for Lab ID event reporting, and you know how to correctly set up your monthly reporting plans and how to do your event reporting and or your infection surveillance. Um, wow, I'm going backwards. Here we go. We've talked about definitions and protocols and how to submit event data and specifically how to get your denominator data in correctly. So if we have checked off all of these high points, I feel like we have been successful in helping you to make today your someday for understanding the lab ID event. And y'all have been quite awesome. Uh, so give yourself a pat on the back. Uh, we're going to, um, oh, here's the email address. Let me just say, if you do have any questions, you have specific case scenarios you need assistance with, please email me at nhsn at cdc.gov. We do answer every uh, user email in the order it's received. Uh, so it may take a few days, but we, we definitely do that. Um, and that is 
the completion of the presentation and we're going to move into some case studies now. So I want everybody to just take a deep breath, absorb and and relax. We're getting into the more fun portion of the session. <coughs> Pardon me. All right. <clears throat> So our first case is actually kind of a um, compilation of several different user emails that I got. I, I decided to try to use some, some real case scenarios uh, in, in our case studies. So I looked through and found several that are kind of in, have the same theme. And this, uh, email starts out with, I have a patient admitted to CCU with endocarditis. Blood cultures are collected the day of admission, which is 2519, and they show MRSA. The patient transfers to the surgical unit for a mitral valve replacement evaluation on 210. Part of that assessment includes new, posit uh, new blood cultures, which are still showing MRSA. So that's on 210. The patient has the surgery on 212, and a culture of the valve vegetation shows MRSA. He returns to the surgical unit, where he does well until 216, when he has some cardiac decompensation and goes back to CCU. New blood cultures are collected on 217 and are still showing MRSA. So the user's question is, my facility follows MRSA bacteremia lab ID events. How many MRSA lab ID events would I report? And I will give you just a minute to work through that. You can use your polling devices. You can talk among yourselves and figure it. It's okay. So we're looking like we're kind of low on the one and pretty evenly split between two and three events for this case. So let's look at the correct answer. There are two events for this case. And let's look at why that is. So the patient admits to CCU. That is their first location. And they have blood cultures that are collected in that location on 2-5 and those are positive for MRSA. So event one is reported for 2-5 attributed to CCU. The patient transfers to the surgical unit on 2-10 and they have new blood cultures for MRSA on that date. So these Blood cultures on 210 are the first MRSA positive blood cultures for the patient in this location. So event two is attributed to the surgical unit. So then the patient goes to surgery um, and then transfers back to CCU and there are blood cultures collected 217 which are still positive for MRSA. The CCU location has an event reported on 2-5, which sets a 14-day time frame where you would not report additional events for this patient in that location. So on 2-17, the MRSA positive blood cultures would be attributed to CCU. They are within, or they're less than 14 days from prior positives on 2-5,
and they would be considered a duplicate and would not be reported as a lab ID event. Okay? So this is an illustration of how the 14-day lab ID event rule runs. It is by location. And just because they leave a location doesn't really end the 14 days necessarily. It starts a new 14 days for a new location, but it is still eligible uh, if they get transferred back. And I understand there's a lot of transferring around a facility. Uh, so these are the little nuances to the reporting that you really need to understand that can be helpful to you when you're trying to determine what are your eligible uh, specimens for reporting. And again, you know, that lab ID event calculator might be helpful in this type of a situation. You should check it out. All right. So I thought I had it all together. I thought I had answered their questions and I'd sent them a reply and planned out. And then I got the, the rebound that says, hey, Denise, <laughs> I think you missed the part in my previous email where I noted the patient has endocarditis. So I was able to associate the MRSA positive blood cultures to a present own admission endo. I know that the lab ID event reporting rules are different. Uh, so I did report some MRSA blood cultures for lab ID events, but when I ran my line listing, I have HO events, and this is not correct because the infection was present on admission. And because I've corresponded with this user on a few occasions, <laughs> and please, Send us your emails. We love to hear from you. <laughs> uh, shouldn't the 217 MRSA blood cultures be reported since the lab report is positive? And I've told her many times that lab ID event reporting is a proxy measure based on positive laboratory findings. I just want to, I, I would like to see a show of hands. How many people have emailed me and I have used this is a proxy measure based on a positive laboratory finding? <laughs> Okay, well, I get that. <laughs> so, please correct this as soon as possible and let me know when I can run a new report for my IC committee and my administrators showing that all the events were present on admission. Do, do y'all have any pressure from your, uh, from your committees to try to justify why these things happen? Okay. So, the question is, should the 217 MRSA positive blood culture be entered as an MRSA bacteremic lab ID event? And so your options are no, her symptoms started on admission to the hospital. Yes, it's the first MRSA positive blood specimen collected for this patient and location. No previous positive within 14 days for the location. No, the specimen is collected less than 14 days from a prior positive in this location, or yes, report all positive MRSA blood cultures as MRSA lab ID events. Okay, so I, I will say that 80% 80, 80 of the audience and the web streamers, 79, 80%, were listening to my rationale from the previous slide. <laughs> no, uh, this is not a reportable lab ID event. And again, this is the rationale for that. The patient is admitted to CCU, which is the location. They have a positive lab ID event on 2-5. This starts a 14-day period where additional positive blood cultures collected in this location would be considered duplicate findings. So when the patient transfers back to CCU, he goes back to a location 
where there is a prior positive and the 217 MRSA positive blood culture occurs within 14 days of this prior positive. If you want to use your fingers and count, 14 plus 5 gives you until uh, 219 before a new blood culture showing MRSA would be reportable for this location. So no. And I thought again, why? Oh, wait a minute. Is this? Yep. Okay. All right. So um, let's talk about why is the 210 event categorized as an HO event? If you've got the little case scenario, you'll remember we had our first event on hospital day one, which was 25, and then we had our second event on 210. So the 210 event automatically becomes an HO event when you submit it into the NHSN application. And why is that? Oh, uh, yes. It automatically becomes HO because it occurs on hospital day six, which is after hospital day four. And the definition for healthcare onset is an event occurs on or after hospital day four. Remember, the CO, the HO assignments are location level assignments. And it is strictly date based. We use the date admitted to the facility and the date of the positive specimen to come up with the date of occurrence and the date of occurrence in this event is hospital day six. All right, so then the boomerang effect. Yes. No, no, no. The lab ID event reporting module is flawed. I acknowledge that. <laughs> NHSN is lost and not listening to me. The patient had endocarditis on admission, and all of these MRSA positive blood cultures are due to that condition. And remember, she proved that. If you know, if you think back to yesterday with your your BSI presentation, we offer a means to clinically associate positive blood cultures with different primary sites of infection. So she she did a very fine job of determining that she met endo and she had blood cultures that she could associate with it. Um, so it's totally unfair to my facility to require, to report any events and there's detrimental financial impact because of these increased HO events that really aren't really HO events. And I'd like to request an exclusion for reporting events when they are clearly associated to another site of infection. I want to remove the 210 event from the database. I don't like the reporting guidance and I think it's grossly unfair. Please change it. Yes. So we do hear that on occasion. <laughs> but can the request for deleting the HO event from the NHSN database be honored? And the answer is no. <laughs> you are correct, 100%. You own your data. We accept your data as you give it to us. We do not adjust it. We do not add to it. We don't take away from it. We certainly don't delete anything. Um, we maintain your data for you, but you drive your data. So here is my thoughts on this case. If you write to us and you, you give us feedback, we take it, we listen, and we uh, discuss feedback. We review our protocols 
routinely and we use users feedback in a lot of situations to try to determine whether changes, adjustments can be made. So we we do listen to what you have to say. And as was mentioned yesterday during the BSI, we're currently in a public comment period uh, for BSI and outpatient component reporting right now. And so MDRO will have its turn in the public reporting forum uh, at some point in the future. But for right now, we are listening to what you have to say when you send us your emails. What about that endocarditis? So I, I don't doubt that the patient had endocarditis and perhaps from the clinical perspective, the MRSA positive blood cultures are associated to an endocarditis. However, in lab ID event reporting, there is no clinical consideration. So even if you had a doctor write somewhere that the patient has endocarditis and all of the positive uh, blood cultures are the result of this infection, no clinical information at all influences your lab ID event reporting. It truly is strictly based on meeting the definitions using the positive laboratory findings. So it might not be everything you want it to be, but that is how the module works. We think that the trade-offs are about equal uh, benefits wise. So she didn't like it and she wants to change it. And I just reminded her that we, we cannot change data. Uh, if you are using the database, your facility, or uh, you're probably an administrator at your facility signed an agreement to participate. And part of that agreement is that you follow our uh, guidance as we deliver it. And um, we, we don't adjust anything on your behalf. So enough of that. <laughs> a new case. So this is Rose, a little baby, uh, from a hospital out in the Midwest. And nine months after a long blackout related to a snowstorm, the neonatal units at Memorial Medical Center are filled to capacity. In an effort to find room at the end for new births, the infants that are housed in the extended stay nursery are moved to the hospital's pediatric unit. And this includes Rose, aged four months, who has been hospitalized since birth um, and she, with a known diagnosis of short gut syndrome. Now, if short gut syndrome very often does uh, create loose stools. So when Rose is seen on the peds unit by a new resident, he notes these watery stools and he orders a C. difficile screen. An unformed stool specimen is collected and submitted for toxin testing, which returns C. diff positive. The facility follows FACWIDE in C. difficile lab ID event reporting on their monthly reporting plan. So, everybody got the general gist of the case? The question is, should the C. difficile finding be entered into NHSN as a lab ID event? Yes, toxin positive specimens collected from a pediatric inpatient location. No specimens from babies are excluded from CDI lab ID event reporting. Or no, there is no event as the patient has known short gut syndrome. So we're about three quarters or so say yes, with the others saying no. And the correct answer is yes. <clears throat> A pediatric unit is an eligible inpatient location. And remember, lab ID event reporting is by patient and location. We don't have any specific age stipulations other than we do exclude traditional baby-based locations from C. diff um, 
monitoring. So if Rose had stayed in a traditional baby-based unit, this event would not have been reported because the location is excluded from reporting. There are no age associations in Lab ID event reporting. In this case, we have an unformed stool specimen that tests positive, uh, toxin positive for C. difficile, and she was on an eligible inpatient location, and this would be a Lab ID event. We good on that? All right, so let's move on and say, how will NHSN categorize this CDI event? All right, the majority of people think it's an HO event, and that is correct. I didn't give you any really specific dates, but I did put in here that Rose was four months old. She has been hospitalized since birth. So obviously this CDI event occurs after hospital day four. So it would be an HO event. All right, another case. Is this a lab ID event? So the Christmas party for the IP team is a fun night of whirly ball. The most competitive of the bunch, Deb, gets caught in the crossfire of car bumps and tumbles onto the field where an overenthusiastic colleague bumps into her. I just have to tell you, the NHSN team did whirly ball at Christmas. This is almost a true scenario. <laughs> After a short hospital stay related to a knee injury, Deb is transferred to an LTAC for rehab. The LTAC follows VRE Lab ID events on their monthly reporting plan, and they have a VRE active surveillance testing program where they collect rectal swabs. And recto, uh, Deb's rectal swab returns VRE positive. Is this an eligible finding for lab ID event reporting? Yes or no? Okay. The correct answer is no. Active surveillance tests are not eligible for lab ID event reporting. We very clearly have here that their VRE AST program uses rectal swab collections and it is that active surveillance test that is noted to be VRE positive. Therefore, it is not an eligible finding with lab ID event reporting. Okay. All right, is this a lab ID event? Laura enjoys the neighborhood's New Year's Eve festivities until an errant toss from the axe throwing event lands her in the community hospital with a head injury. Laura lives in the same community with Kim and Janet. <laughs> She's stabilized, but a few days into the stay, she develops loose stools and a test for CDI returns positive so Laura is transferred to MMC, which is a sister facility to the community hospital, where she receives a higher level of care. A copy of her medical record accompanies her to MMC, and the CDI positive report is included. This is the first admission for Laura to MMC. She does well and on hospital day 10 is ready for discharge when she's noted to have a single loose stool. The attending wants to ensure her CDI is not recurring, so he orders a new CDI test on this specimen. MMC uses PCR testing for C. diff detection and the final laboratory report reads PCR positive. Is this a lab ID event? Yes or no? Oh, 
wow, I think you've reached up to the top of success. <laughs> yes, this is a Lab ID event. This is the first admission for Laura to M MC on hospital day 10. There is a loose stool specimen that tests CD positive. First positive finding for the patient and the location. So this is a lab ID event. So how is the hospital day 10 event reported? Is it an HO event for the community hospital? Is it a co hicfa event for MMC based on the prior positive at the community hospital? Is it an HO event for MMC but considered recurrent due to the prior positive at the sister facility? Or it's an HO event for MMC and also an incident event since this is the first positive at MMC. So I'll let you consider those answers and let's see where we land with all of this. Okay, so the correct answer is, this is an incident HO event for MMC. And why is that? So as we have talked during the session, we're reporting based on the first positive finding for the patient and the location. And reporting is facility specific. So this is the first event for Laura at MMC. It occurs on hospital day 10. It meets the CDI definition because we tested unformed stool and received a PCR positive CDI finding. So it does get reported as a lab ID event. Hospital Day 10 is going to give it the location level assignment of healthcare onset. It's the first positive ever for Laura at this facility, so it's additionally an incident event. And because NHS reporting is by single facility, what happened at the community hospital prior to admission to MMC has no influence on reporting at MMC. I will just, I get questions about sister facilities frequently, and we do understand that while you share a medical record, for example, and you have access to prior positives or you have knowledge of prior positives, we don't have that information in the NHSN application, and we can't search across different facilities to find information uh, that would be problematic at a lot of different levels, one being that there's no way that we could verify that patients are always being identified in exactly the same manner, but the application just doesn't have that capability. So this is an incident HO event for MMC. Well, you have been a grand group. I appreciate your uh, time and your attention. We are going to uh, open the floor up for questions very quickly. If you have any questions that you want to bring up, step to the microphone, um, and then we'll look at the web, too. Uh, this has been a question within my facility. We have local facilities that are testing C. diff with PCR and then following it with a lower sensitivity test, EA, EIA, and they're only reporting that what's positive for the EAI because it's the last test, but they're treating the patient from the PCR test. Is NHSN going to address that at all? No. It's gaming the system. <laughs> um, it, it's, yeah, okay. We, uh, if we, if we, I will tell you that there are lots of conversations about C. diff within NHSN, within CDC. I, I'm on about four different working groups where we're trying to come up with a good uh, 
definition that can address C. difficile on a lot of different levels. The testing parameters are particularly challenging, number one, because testing methodologies are evolving so quickly, we really can't keep up with that. And our basic intent for this module has always been to let the facility decide what type of testing suits their personal facility goals. Um, you know, basically when you decide what kind of C. difficile test you're going to use, you need to look at a variety of different things, including, um, you know, maybe your laboratory resources or your testing stewardship, uh, antibiotic stewardship. It's more than just whether or not you participate in lab ID event reporting that drives that decision. And there are just huge differences in how facilities do test. So right now, we are still very strong in that we feel like the facilities need to be able to make decisions on the testing parameters and we hope that that decision is not based on the idea that it would game NHSN. There is a CMS uh, communique on gaming uh, so eventually it would really have some adverse uh, uh, effects on the facility should should it be determined that is occurring. In in the NHSN where it says what primary what your primary test is, why shouldn't that say what is your last test? What are you basing these results on? Because I'm, yeah, I'm going to defer that to my my uh, analysis colleagues who will be speaking after the break. Because basically, um, they're basing it on EAI and not PCR, but PCR is their basic test, so that's what they're they're putting in there. So they are getting well. The, the prime the word primary is the key, and primary for NHSM purposes means a test is used in greater than fifty percent of all tests performed. Uh, so that's a little nuance, but I will defer that to my Matt colleagues who are very happy to discuss that. <laughs> Good, morning. Good morning. I want to go back to the MRSA person that had three blood cultures, and the second one was called hospital acquired, even though she'd had a previous. Uh, and you also mentioned the non-unique and the unique tests mm -hmm. column. Do the non-unique tests uh, impact our SIR? They do not. They do not. Okay, good. Thank you. Yes. Do we have anything from the web? <coughs> okay. Yep, there we go. Okay. Uh, to clarify, if a facility has an off-site inpatient rehab or inpatient behavioral facility, any positive results are considered a continuous stay. Is this correct? Off-site? Okay, to clarify, if a facility has an off-site inpatient rehab, let's answer that one. So an off-site inpatient rehab outside an acute care facility should be enrolled in NHSN as a freestanding rehab facility. And it's its own facility. And then well, how do they handle inpatient behavioral facilities? Is would, this a continuous stay? If they are off-site, the rehab and or the psych should be enrolled in NHSN as their own facility, and it would not be a continuous stay from the acute care hospital because they are physically separate locations. Okay, thank you. Uh, regarding the exception for FAC White in Lab ID event reporting, the affiliated outpatient location, does this apply to outpatient locations that are in the same healthcare system, such as a sister hospital ED or physician office that uses the same medical record? Well, there has to be some sort of a um, association between the physician office and the hospital in addition to the medical record. They should be a source of admission, for example. Um, 
Uh, if you have an ED at a sister facility, that ED is going to be associated to the sister facility, so it would not be an affiliated outpatient location. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Hi. <clears throat> I just want to go back and clarify. Um, when we have the lab ID, the MRSA lab ID, and you have patients that are transferred throughout the hospital, going back to that scenario with the endocarditis, so clarify for me when it's if if the patient has repeated that are coming in and they look like HOs because they are in a new location so it's the first time in that new location when you're saying unique is that taken out of the is that recognized when you report into CMS like is CMS only seeing that first one or are they all going into CMS like so that a facility that does have someone with endocarditis that keeps moving around and are in multiple locations that are showing up that they have three bacteremias because they were in ICU, they were in a step down, and they were in a surgical unit. It, right. That's the question coming from my state that we're having a lot of issues with facilities. So are, can we help by understanding what's going to CMS? So CMS gets the outcome measure of your MRSA bacteremic SIR. They don't get specific events. Okay. And your SIR pot includes unique blood source healthcare onset events only. Those are the only events that go into the SIR. So it's one time. It's unique for the patient. I, I'm. I'm. Just you can. You can have more than one unique blood source for the same patient if they have a long hospitalization and there is greater than 14 days between blood culture collections, mm -hmm. uh, you could have a patient with more than one unique blood source under that scenario. But if you're talking about a patient who admits to ICU and stays for four days and then moves to a medical unit and stays for two days and then moves to a CCU and you have positive blood cultures within a 14-day period of time, the first positive is your unique blood source, and then your subsequent positives are non-unique because they occurred within 14 days of that first one. Okay, that's... They're still, they still may be HO events subsequently. Mm -hmm. But it's, you're looking at the 14, even though we're sending it in, it's the first time in that location for that patient, so we're submitting it. If it's within that 14-day range, we're still, those are being pushed aside. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's unique and then there's non-unique. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, are we Did out of time? It? Okay, I have to send you to break, but I'm going to be right over here. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to speak further with you. Thank you again. Appreciate your attention. Thank you.